Welcome to the Mix Minus, Picks Minus, or Picks Plus or Minus NFL Over Unders podcast for the 2017 18 NFL season. Is this our second time doing this, Tim, or has it been like three years now? This is our second. This is number two. Okay, and we were actually, we did, we hovered around 500. I think I just snuck into the playoffs. You might have just missed it. You were sort of like the uh, New Orleans Saints, and I was maybe that 9-7 and Giants team who, uh, you know, from years past who snuck in and had a little bit of a run, but we weren't that far apart. I did uh, poorly. I think I went out on too many limbs with some teams. So I think that informed my picks this season. So I'm going to take a more cautious approach. Yeah, I think it's tough, though, because when you look at the over-unders, you got to look at the over-unders and then you got to look at the schedules. And you could think a team is going to be really, really good. Um, like I think a lot of us are falling for the Tampa Bay Bucks this year. You kind of fell for them last year, but we're falling for them this year because they're on hard knocks and they look so damn impressive playing against each other and the, the personalities and who they've brought in. But um, as we'll get to, they'll be really later on in the show because we're going to go in alphabetical order. But sometimes the schedule just um, just decides the thing for you and you can't find a way to the successful numbers that they would need to get where they need to go. And I think you find that with a lot of this. It's like you agonize over this and you probably need to do some kind of algorithmic Pythagorean theorem to figure out the wins and losses. Cause I'm sure when you're going through this, uh, even though you like, you'll pick a team, uh, they'll beat it in this scenario. But then when you're looking at the other team, uh, from their point of view, you know, we're probably not consistent is what I'm trying to say. It's not like we're perfectly aligned with the wins and losses, right? You kind of have to look at each team, um, in its own kind of shell, right? Yes, yeah. And um, when going through the schedule and then seeing just the streaks that they would be on or could be on when you're making those picks. Now, in a couple of cases, I looked at uh, the totality of a single team season and realized that I, I couldn't really have them going on a six game winning streak. <laughs> that just uh, defies some logic. So I, I did have to go back and make some adjustments. And at the same time, there, there are certain teams that who wouldn't be going on extended losing streaks. Um, and you have to look at the travel east to west and, you know, where they are back to back, if they're on the road back to back, how long they're at home. So you try and factor all that in and in the end uh, it doesn't quite, work out um but we'll see all right well let's jump right in right at the start with the arizona cardinals who um i think had grander plans last year and uh and fell off on that this year they are um eight is the over under eight wins is the over under um if you go under though you'll make money on your hundred dollars if you go over you got to spend 155 dollars to win a hundred so obviously the more popular pick is over, but I feel like that eight is kind of low. I actually have them going 10 and six. They have the player who could be the MVP and David Johnson. They have all the weapons they do. Bruce Arians coaches, you know, the team real well. They have a good, um, they have a good upper management. Uh, they just put a good product out on the field and they sort of are just one of these, they, they, they kind of have their own personality and they bring it and they're not, uh, they're not going year to year without you knowing who they are. Of course, their quarterback is kind of the issue because he's the one piece that can go year to year and you don't know what you're getting, almost like a middle reliever in baseball. But I still see them going 10 and 6, and I see them on the over. How about you? I am at 10 and 6 as well. Uh, that may be a legacy pick on my on my behalf just because I've been a big fan of the Cardinals for a few years now. I thought uh, back in, oh, I think two thousand. 13, maybe 2014, now I forget. Uh, I actually thought they were the third best team in the NFL, even though they didn't win the Super Bowl or didn't even make the playoffs because uh, they were in the same division as the 49ers and the Seahawks and just fin- and finished just outside of the playoffs. Yet uh, I, I really thought they were the third best team in the league. Uh, so this may be a legacy pick on my part. Just uh, I'm, I'm a fan of Arian system. I'm a fan of the talent they have on both sides of the ball. I think uh, they have one of the best secondary players in the league. I think they have obviously one of the best receivers in the league, even though he may be toward the end of his career. So I uh, I initially had them at nine and seven, but then in going back, I actually adjusted it upward toward 10 and six. 
Well, isn't it nice though? Even if you go nine and seven, you still have the over. I, I kind of like that. Yes. I hate when the pick. I hate when they land you on the number you get at, and you really have to go out on a limb to go either way on it. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and I, as we go along, there's maybe two or three cases like that, but for the most part, I'm, I clear the overs and the unders. And I also kind of like the, the, their schedule. I think they can get off to a to a fast start. We found out tonight that Ezekiel Elliott, his six game suspension will be um, upheld. Of course, he gets to play the New York Giants on Sunday Night Football. Uh, you know that's a tough one. But the Giants did win this game last year and their other game uh, against the Cowboys. But you know, starting at Detroit, who I don't think is going to be, um, I think they'll be a beatable team. They'll be facing Dallas at home in the third week. Obviously, without Ezekiel Elliott, you can really load the box against uh, Dak Prescott at Indiana or Indianapolis. They could be a, uh, you know, who knows if Luck's back. And I still don't believe in that team a lot, even though Vegas seems to have them pretty high up. They're going to be playing San Francisco, who I don't think is good. I think there's a lot of winnable games on their schedule, which also helps them get to 10 and 6. I think so, too. I think they're, you know, they're playing the. AFC uh, South this year, which is not the strongest of the division. So they can pick up possibly uh, two, uh, two relatively easy games, maybe even three, if you depend on where you land on Houston. So that definitely helps them. And um, I think uh, their schedule is pretty favorable. Otherwise, I mean, they have Seattle in their own division. That's always tough. Um, but you also have uh, a weak San Francisco team and a relatively weak Rams team. So they're, when you can sort of build up a fairly solid base within your own division like that and grab two to three to four wins there, uh, that provides a pretty good foundation. Next up, we have the Super Bowl champion. I mean, um, through three quarters, Super Bowl champion, yeah. Atlanta Falcons. There is... Um, it's sort of deja vu. You have the team from that uh, division coming in uh, after a season where they really played well. Carolina played even better than uh, Atlanta the year before. They had the MVP, and obviously Carolina was kind of shellacked in their Super Bowl. Atlanta was doing the shellacking and then somehow blew a 25-point lead in the third quarter of a Super Bowl. I think there's definitely some worry about hangover. But I also think they have so many weapons. And when you have offensive weapons, um, it's almost hard. I don't see how they can fall off. I mean, when you think about the the level of skill that their two running backs have, which are just about as good as each other, and somehow they have both of them. When you think about Julio Jones, when you just think up and down their offensive lineup, it's almost one of those deals where a baseball team is prolific and they lose in a World Series, but they're going to come out hitting the next year anyway. I don't see... Um, you know, nine and a half is tough because the team could go nine and seven and still have a good year. I have Atlanta going 11 and five though. I have them at 12 and four, uh, which actually surprised me when I went through the schedule. I didn't head into it thinking I was going to pick them at 12 and four, but that's where I landed just because I think they do have some favorable matchups. Uh, to your point, uh, I think everyone is concerned about the hangover. Um, and I'm usually not a fan of, uh, Super Bowl losers coming back the next season. There's, I think, some history against those teams uh, before how they perform the following year. But I think that Atlanta has so much athleticism on both sides of the ball and had has so much talent, as we saw in the first three quarters of the Super Bowl, uh, that um, I still think that they have, you know, you, you think 11, I think 12, uh, so we're close. But I think they have double digits win, double digit wins in them this year. Now, if you had to rank the last three Super Bowl losers in terms of the heartbreak, how would you do it between Atlanta, Carolina, and Seattle? Uh, Atlanta has to be first, I think, just to have uh, just to have had such the lead that they did, and really they they can go back. I mean, we all have done it, where we've gone back over you know multiple plays in the second half where if they had just made a simple decision whether it be to have kicked a field goal or run the football in different cases i think that is uh i think that's got to stick with them more i think uh next would be seattle just in terms of that uh, <laughs> being on um, the goal line 
on the goal line, <laughs> having it, and I, I just think that that uh, no one, well, I guess some people do, but like you, you don't really hear about that Seattle game after because of the Atlanta game, uh, and then lastly, I think uh, the Carolina Panthers. Um, you, you know, you're almost I, rather that because you're out early, you're still in a Super Bowl. You, you don't have to have like the agony of de- the defeat was felt early on. <laughs> yes, um, it was, and. Uh, yeah, it was. So I just, yeah, that last last season was, that was just dreadful for those poor Atlanta fans. So, um, but I think, uh, we'll say I, it, it's interesting to see. I mean, it's a lot on, on Quinn right now in terms of how he can rally the troops and how focused he can keep them. But, I mean, you can also look at jumping sports. You can look at uh, an analog with uh, the San Antonio Spurs and losing the way that they did in just, crushing fashion uh in 2013 and then to come back to stay focused for an entire season and get back against the same team and just take care of business the way they did so uh if i were were quinn i would be you know pointing to the spurs as an example or the warriors (laughs) or or the warriors that was pretty heartbreaking to to, because they they sort of had the series equivalent of a 25 point lead and yes. being up 3-1. So, yeah, there's plenty of stuff to point to. Those crazy Black Swan events seem to have really been taking place over the last 15 or 16 years in particular. And it actually makes you think when you look over the last three Super Bowls, and we'll get to it with, with New England, but I sort of think we're overvaluing New England, New England a little bit because they came out with the wins in those. But really, you look at the fact they're down 25 in the third quarter in one, and they're on the goal line ready to lose in another Talk about serendipity. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, they've also been on the other end of it too, twice. Uh, oh yeah, we are with our team. So, <laughs> as, as I like, I am as much as maybe I've wanted to see some of the NFC team, it's NFC teams win those Super Bowls. Uh, I still don't mind the fact that the Giants are the only franchise to have defeated the new this version of the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl. Next up, I think this to me is a is a high number at nine for the Baltimore Ravens. Mm -hmm. I think that they're on the kind of slow progression downwards um, from their Super Bowl run. And I know they made some free agent deals. They've drafted some guys. People are talking about them potentially being a number one defense, but I just, there's, there's something about uh, Joe Flacco over the last couple of years that just gives me difficulty. That's a hard number. If it were seven and a half, I would feel a little difficult. I still have them going seven and nine, but I, I just have a hard time. It almost feels like that period of time with Eli Manning after the after the second Super Bowl when they had that just run of major drop off before uh, restocking with the team they did last year, and them then them uh, sorry them having pretty much one of, one of the best, if not the best, defense in football now. But um, I have them at seven and nine. I think they always have. A difficult schedule. Um, I think Cleveland's going to be a little better than people think, and they're going to be tougher to play. Doesn't mean they're not going to win both of those, Baltimore. But I don't know. I, I had trouble. I had trouble getting them. Uh, even if I got to eight, I'm still okay on the under. Uh, but I, I saw seven and nine. How about you? I have eight and eight, so not far apart. Um, I think I give them probably eight just because the nucleus of that entire franchise is so strong uh, from management to coach you have a super winning quarterback. So I think all those elements uh, themselves uh, add up to a fairly solid record. Uh, I'm going to say that also about another team. You can say that about actually all the teams, but one in that division are very similar in that regard in terms of the continuity that they have from top to bottom. But uh, to me, that equals eight and eight. They kind of remind me a little bit of the, Packers during the Mike Sherman years, where you still had Brett Favre, you had uh, uh, you had the for a little while you had the GM, then Sherman became the GM, but you still had the the the, the foundation from the Super Bowl teams, uh, and they still managed to win. And you still could count on them, and they would get to the playoffs or near the playoffs with some solid records, but uh, they still seem to be missing one or two things. So that's my view of the Ravens right now. They play in a tough division, uh, but I still think that they can get eight wins in that division next up we got the buffalo bills they're at six i have them under uh at five and eleven 
uh, but I wrote in my notes, it's very hard for me not to have them at six. I didn't want to be hedging, you know, right at the number, but I did have them under. I think there's something about the team right when you don't, right when you think they're going to fall off a cliff, they don't. They come, they come back. Uh, Tyrod Taylor is throwing a beautiful deep ball. LaShawn McCoy's running through the defense. Their defense gets bully ball. But I wonder if that was more a mark of Rex Ryan, like where he can get a team to do that. And maybe they've lost that by him being gone. But I still think that that personality is still going to be there. And I think they're going to have a couple of games where people go, oh, you know what? They're, they're actually not that bad. Um, but I still have them on the under at 5-11. and 11. I have them at under, but uh, I'm not as generous as you. I have them at three and thirteen. So uh, I've been looking at their the losses I gave them. I could talk myself into very easily giving them some wins in those cases, but I just think that uh, they're a, we're looking at a three and thirteen team, and I think uh, I think they may want to be a three and thirteen team based on some of the moves that they've made and what what they're looking at in terms of the future. Yeah, I mean, I gave them a couple of wins when teams who are not from cold weather or playing domes come into their stadium when it starts getting really cold but it's tough yeah we're still we're still under so yeah it's gonna kind of be a rebuilding job there and how long has it been since they've been in the playoffs like 20 years 19 Uh, years well it depends upon what season you count but uh 99 i think or 98 it's crazy i mean oh my god it was the Music City Miracle. That was the last time they were in the playoffs. Oh, my God. Yeah, Peter King wrote about that last week, how there could have been a kid who was in starting high school when they were last in the playoffs, and now he's married, had kids, <laughs> you know, has a job, a home. It's, it's, it's the, curse of Doug, the curse of Doug Flutie. They never should, have, never should have sat Doug Flutie for the playoffs. Yeah, and uh, another one of these deals where they got a young coach, right? So I'm... They do, McDermott. Yeah, yeah. McDermott. I don't he's a, know. He was a defensive, he's a defensive coach and uh, who's following a defensive coach. So that is a curious move. But um, we'll see. I, I think that this is a team that is not really playing for this year. No, which is a tough pill to swallow. It's sort of like Cleveland like that in a way where, uh, and we'll be there in a couple, but where it's so long and it's so sad that you have to sort of be rebuilding again. I think Cleveland's in a better position right now, but uh, it's kind of crazy. They're very similar if you think about it. You know, right along the lake there, you got the uh, you, you got the amazing turnover. You got the quarterbacks. You got the um, you got the hope and the uh, disappointment continually, and you got a whole lot of no playoffs. Um, next up, really fascinating. The team who went fifteen and one, right? Or was it? Yeah, it was fifteen and one, right? Two years ago. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and as we said, lost after really playing bully ball through the playoffs too that year, and were really humbled by uh, that defense and a going out on his horse, Peyton Manning. The Carolina Panthers they have really become a team. I think that people maybe feel like that was their Cinderella year, and when you look at their record over time. They really are more the team that's maybe around or below 500 than they are that one shining moment team. But I tell you what, I still had them on the over, and that's an over at eight and a half. The weapons they have, um, I think Cam can find something again. Uh, you know, he was humbled from the minute last season started as well, having to go and play Denver again in Denver, and he was really beat up. Luke Keekley's great. Now he's one hit away from being gone in many ways. Uh, that was a terrible hit he had last year there. And when you play with the head like that and you're a linebacker, you really can't trust things. They were really hurt by losing uh, Josh Norman, I think. I, I, I do believe that they undervalued what he meant to their entire defense. But I am so excited to watch Christian McCaffrey. And I think they're going to be good enough to be at the over. I have them right at nine and seven, but I wrote conservative. So it's always possible they can get another win. But yeah, I saw them at nine and seven. I see them on the over. I have the nine and seven as well for a lot of the same reasons that you pointed out. I think uh, Cam Newton, I'm a, I've, I've always been a Cam Newton fan. I know he has his critics and the fact that he maintains his composure as well as he does, given everything thrown at him is just really commendable, commendable. Um, 
I'm also excited to see Christian McCaffrey. I'm a fan of the McCaffrey family. His father, Ed, of course, was a former Giants receiver, whom they should not have let go, uh, given what he then went on to do. Uh, and also his uncle, Billy, played at Vanderbilt and Duke. He has a uh, national championship ring from 1991 on the Duke team. Um, and uh, so I think Carolina, I mean, it's just, I, I, I think you count out Ron Rivera at your, uh, you know, at your peril. I think he still has this team and I think they've added enough and maintained enough of the components that got them to the Super Bowl that nine and seven is not out of the question. No, and they could do a little more, but I think what happened last year gave you pause for thought. Um, because that, that was a scary drop-off, and it really it made was. you think it was a little, as I said, Cinderella-ish. But think about the team the season before the um, they went to the Super Bowl, which was they had to go on the run at the end. They were, I, I forget what it was, 8-8. Eight and eight. They were an 8-8 eight eight playoff team, or even maybe even below that. And uh, you know, Rivera got them there and held them together, and I think they won a game in the playoffs and then went to Seattle and lost. So uh, it's just kind of the way they play, and that's part of their personality. That's right. Next up, we don't have to talk for long because there is not a lot to talk about here. Chicago Bears, they're at a five and a half. I have them on the under at four and 12. I don't see a lot here other than if they give Mitch Trubisky the chance to uh, to play extended time. They really don't have much on this team. When you look at the uh, Sports Illustrated top 400, they have one, two, three, four, five, six. They have like seven uh, or eight, eight guys who even make that list. And uh, the first guy is an offensive lineman at number 59. Their first offensive player is 111, Jordan Howard. There is just not a lot here. Um, I don't see them. I don't see them certainly going on the over. And Sports Illustrated, I think, had them at 6 and 10. I, I don't, I just don't get it. I don't get that either. I'm at 3 and 13, so I'm even less gracious than you are. I think that they're, the, the front office and the head coach are not on the same page, which is never a good sign. Uh, I feel bad for John Fox. I'm a John Fox fan. I would wish he had taken a year off from the Denver job before jumping into the Chicago job. I think he would have been better off and he would have had other opportunities. So I'm sorry to see this happen to him. Uh, but I don't think the talent is there on either side of the ball to win all that much. Now, their division, you have Green Bay, you have Detroit, you have Minnesota. I mean, Detroit and Minnesota are you know a little I'm, – I'm not that high on either one of them, so – Maybe they they win one or two more games than I'm uh, allotting them right now, but uh, I have them at three and thirteen, and and they face really. the AFC North, mm-hmm. which is brutal. Yeah. So yeah, yeah not brutal. not friendly on either side in nature or nurture. No. Um, next up, we got the Cincinnati Bengals. There's a lot of respect here at an eight and a half, and they haven't lost a lot in terms of their offensive weapons. They added, which was the kind of quintessential Cincinnati Bengal, the uh, the player who was sort of a fallen angel because of off-the-field issues, and they pick him up in the second round, and Joe Mixon will probably be great for them. Um, I think they're going to do enough where they're going to be in it in the season, uh, but I have them at 8-8. Eight and eight. It was a very hard one, but I have them at 8-8 eight and eight, just below um, on the under, and I would actually have to lay 130 to win a hundred dollars there. So more people are on the under it's even on the over, but I, I do have them on the, uh, under, I don't have them falling apart though. I have an eight and as well. So we're on the same page. Uh, much like with Baltimore, I give the continuity within the front office and the head coaching staff. Uh, I give that a couple of games each season. Uh, I'm a, I'm a Marvin Lewis fan, despite how he's performed in the playoffs. I am a fan of his. And they still have a good quarterback, and they have offensive weapons around them. And they, I think, you know, they play in a tough division. But nevertheless, I think they can get to 8-8. Eight and eight. Do you take Andy Dalton or uh, Kirk Cousins? Um, that's a good question. I... I might take Kirk Cousins. Haven't you gained a lot of respect for him being in division? Like I, I, I disrespected him a little bit, but I think I've gained a respect for him. Yeah, I respect. I mean, look where he came from. I mean, drafted the same draft as RG three. Uh, not really given much of a chance to be more than a backup to RG three, or it was just the old Ron Wolf strategy of taking multiple quarterbacks and then developing them for 
uh, trade possibilities down the line. Uh, but he stayed there, and, and he's he's weathered some, uh, you know, some ups and downs. He was there for the Shanahan, and, you know, circus, and then ultimately the ouster. And then uh, when Gruden was there, it was not exactly smooth sailing at the start. And uh, he's played very well. He's been steady and has you know, hasn't been rewarded with the long term deal, but uh, has you know been well paid and. Had them on the doorstep of the playoffs last year, which would have made two years in a row if he had gotten them there, and that counts for something in this league. And look what he did for Sean McVay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah he did. He did a lot there. And you know, I, I, were, I was talking to you about this earlier, but when I heard him on the interview with um, Peter King's M, uh, MMQB podcast, he brought up a good point when Peter King said to him, "Are you? Do you feel disrespected, or you know, do you wish they'd commit to you?" And he, I think he said, yeah, sure. But, you know, he's made something like $74 million over three years, taking the one-year deals, the one-year franchise tenders. And then he said, hey, look at Brock Osweiler. He got the four-year deal, $74 million, but that didn't last very well. He's already on his back on his uh, original team after two stops in like 18 months. So I think in the NFL, it's just different. Don't worry about the respect. Respect is getting paid the most amount of money you possibly can each year. It's almost the Darrell Rivas way of going. And he is quietly, think about him being, um, think about him quietly becoming almost a sympathetic figure, <laughs> making the money he does every year. It's pretty amazing. Uh, it is, but uh, yeah, as I said, I give him credit for hanging in there among multiple regimes. It's difficult for a quarterback with his background to, um, emerge the way that he has within a franchise like the Redskins, which is not the most stable. Yeah, he's kind of the perfect quarterback that way. Uh, next up, speaking of unstable quarterbacks, how many is it? 27 since 1999 or something? Well, well here's a question. Who is the last coach to take Cleveland to the playoffs? I've, it, it's not like Butch, what's, whatever his name it is. It is. It's Butch Davis. Butch Davis. What year was that? What? That was, oh boy. Uh, I feel like I he was just there, and it was probably a really long time ago. 2002, 2003. Wow, Butch Davis. Whew. Yeah, it was Butch Davis. Um, Unbelievable. And he's at Florida yeah. International now. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, here's a team. Yeah. Cleveland just needs to look up at the three teams above them in their division for how they should proceed. And the hope is that ownership has gotten that that message after the revolving door that they've had with head coaches and also with front office personnel. So uh, I think they need to just settle in a little bit, uh, take their lumps. And um, I expect that there'll be some progress this year. I mean, I have them at five and 11. Oh, good. Um, You're on the over. I'm just I'm on, on the over. I'm uh, Oh, it's funny. Uh, they're four and a half, which is quite a jump for a team who won one game. I mean, when you think mm-hmm. about four more wins to get to the over, but there, it's going to be a different story. I wrote here, I have them in the over, but I feel 4-12. and 12. But I see them coming on so uh, so much that I'm rooting for the over, and hence I've put the over, even though I had them at 4-12. and 12. I mean, Miles, uh, Miles Garrett's going to be unreal. I mean, he's going to be such an imposing force. Jabril Peppers in the secondary is going to be great. I hope he's returning kicks. I did not watch in the, uh, in the preseason. The uh, I, I like the gutsy move to start with the rookie, Deshaun Kaiser. Uh, maybe Dak Prescott, what he did with Dallas, is giving people uh, the cover to make those gutsy calls, as as Pete Carroll did with uh, Russell Wilson. Um, in many ways, getting a huge contract guy in to compete and potentially win the job, and that guy fell by the wayside. I'm not saying Deshaun Kaiser going to do that. Um, I watch a lot of college football, and I can't tell you I remember a signature moment of him at Notre Dame. I feel like he was injured uh, quite a bit, but I can't um, remember him. But I could see him doing something. And Hugh Jackson's a quarterback guy, so you don't think he's going to go on a limb for someone who he doesn't think gets it. I think this team is going to be markedly improved, competitive, professional, and when you have a defense potentially coming together, they have Greg Williams there now, which is kind of interesting. He left, uh, or he was let go with um, with last year's uh, Los Angeles Rams staff. Saw a lot of him on that All or Nothing show, but he'll be there. Um, I didn't love him in that show. The cursing is overboard. Uh, I don't think it gets through to anyone. He's a little about like the uh, showmanship of himself. Uh, we obviously know he was in Bounty Gate. 
but he's going to coach these guys. This might be his moment where he gets to be on the come up with a real young, fun uh, group of players. I could see them. I've I've put the over. I said four and twelve, but for the over, I need them at five wins. So let's see them get there. Next up, we have the Dallas Cowboys. I underestimated them last year, obviously, <laughs> by far. I think we all did. That was a bit of a mm-hmm. shock to the system. Uh, they're at nine and a half this year, which shows you something. A team that won 15 games drops down to nine and a half, which is still a big number. It's hard to go on the over at that level. Uh, you have to lay 115 on either side uh, to win $100. Um, as we said, Ezekiel Elliott, uh, which came across the wires tonight, will be out for games two through seven. He will play in the game against the Giants. But I tell you, I added up their schedule, and it's probably because they were so good last year. They have a tough schedule. Also being in the NFC East, it's very tough. But I have them going eight and eight on the under, the nine and a half under. I have, made, I have them at eight and eight as well. Oh my God. And we did not coordinate yes, this. We did not. Uh, I think that actually is... I. I think it's a pretty fair call looking at their schedule and going through where I gave them some good wins, but also just gave them some tough losses as well. Uh, I, you know, they do have a tough schedule. The NFC East, I mean, it's going to be competitive. I'm not going to say it's, it's a challenging division, but it will be competitive. Uh, they have to play green Bay, but they also have some relatively easy games with San Francisco in there as well. Uh, but you know, however, Kansas, on the road, on the road, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and Kansas City's tough. Um, Oakland is tough, uh, you know. But then you know they do have uh, the Chargers as well. So I, I, I think I, I feel it's a fair assessment at eight and eight. They could surprise us again, but um, you know they don't have a great defense. They have a very good offense that can play very can play spectacularly on some some occasions. But their defense is fair, and I think. Uh, with the schedule they have, that gets into eight and eight. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Dak when Ezekiel Elliott's not there, and they can really load up on him. I know that they have Darren McFadden there, who anybody could pretty much run through this number one ranked offensive line. But I think Ezekiel Elliott was a little different. I mean, he's a he's a bit more of a special player on the field. So we're going to see a lot, and I think it almost might have been better for the Cowboys if Elliott was just out from game zero through six. Because if I think I think if they lose to the Giants in the first game, and then all of a sudden you're going to Denver in Week Two, and then you don't have Elliott, and now you're going against that defense, things can just my my worry for the Cowboys, and I don't have many worries, is to come out of the first five games before the bye at two and three would be quite a win. Um, that is a tough that's a tough run. Uh, the the Rams are obviously a winnable game, although they're going to be improved, and that's a brutal defense. Um, and who knows how Goff moves up. Obviously, McVay's there, the quarterback whisperer, although we'll see about that. Uh, but I think being at Arizona, it's in, it's imposing being at Denver. If they get two to, two out of three, or, or two and three by the bye, uh, and then they can go into San Francisco, but then at Washington, it's just a tough, tough schedule as things look right now. Yeah, they don't have a week off. <laughs> no. Uh, there isn't a week off. No, it's tough. And then we go from Dallas to Denver. I have a lot of the same feelings, and I think I was right on Denver last year on the under. I have a lot of the same feelings as I did last year. The quarterback situation is still up in the air and a little difficult. I did see a lot from Simeon last year that made me think he was more than – uh, I, I thought he was a nothing. You know, I thought they had no other choice. This Northwestern quarterback, he had some moments. He threw a good deep ball. He had some poise, but I still think they're really missing the quotient there. Their their uh, their quarterback production in no way matches what they have on the defensive end. And um, they're at an eight. They're at uh, eight and a half. I actually have them under at six and ten. Whoa, that's uh, that's a big drop off. I have them at eight and eight. Uh, because of that defense. I think the defense is going to tire out as the season goes on if their offense doesn't uh, produce. And I, I don't feel good about their quarterback situation. And I don't think John Elway feels good about his quarterback situation. I think he really wanted Paxton Lynch to win that job. And uh, he didn't. Uh, so then they're sort of stuck in this other year of wait and see. Um, and uh, that's not good. So I don't really see on the offense side of the ball 
what they're going to do, uh, especially in, again, a very tough AFC West. So you've got Oakland, you have Kansas City. Uh, you also have the Chargers, which is not that they're not that tough, but Oakland and Kansas City are very, very good. And uh, it's and then you have to play the you have to play the NFC East, which is also challenging. So I think the defense is you know strong, not as strong as the Super Bowl year from two years ago, but strong enough to get them to eight wins. But I don't think they've got much beyond that. And we're still on both on the under. Um, yes. <clears throat> next up. Detroit Lions, they finished nine and seven, right? But they were were they nine and four at one point? They really yeah, surprised they people. Tailspin. Yeah, they went to a tailspin at the end of the season. Yep. And then they went to a uh, major spend to uh, bring or to keep the services of Matthew Stafford, uh, who in Sports Illustrated's rankings, I think was just behind Eli Manning, maybe ninth and Eli was eighth, I believe. Detroit, because of the respect I think of last year, they're at Uh, eight for the over under i have them going on the under and i have them at five and eleven i could see six and ten but there is not there's just not a lot there um stafford is really good though i mean he is really good so he could do some things obviously they really surprise people when um when they lost uh the great wide receiver um was johnson right Am I yes, Calvin yeah. Johnson. Calvin Johnson. I was thinking Charles Johnson. I'm like, it's not Charles Johnson. It's Calvin Johnson. That's how quick the NFL is. I forgot the best receiver of the last 15 years. <laughs> um, you know, losing him, and then they kind of did uh, receiver by committee and played really well. And uh, I remember the Giants beating them, and that was kind of the point where you're like, ooh, it's starting to uh, undo a little here. And we'll actually be going to see them, right? Uh, we in, will. In a week against yeah. the Giants on Monday night. September but, 18th. I do have them on the under. It is. I'm not as high on the Vikings as other people, but I do still have them being very competitive. This is a really tough division for pretty much uh, an average, slightly above average football team. And they play the AFC North. That's right. Um, which is yeah, which is very tough. So I am higher on them than you are. I have them at seven and nine. Um, I think they are pretty solid. Uh, I. Stafford, huge amount of respect for him always, but especially after last season, what he played through uh, with the injuries that he did without ever complaining. Uh, I'm also a fan of Jim Caldwell. I like his style. I know a lot of people, he gets a lot of criticism, but I do like his style. I think he's steady. He's been a steadying presence in that organization. Uh, The fact that he brought them to the playoffs two out of three years, which I don't believe they'd ever done before, says something. So I think there uh, there are some good pieces in place and i'm not again i'm not as high in minnesota i'm not they have chicago in their own division they have you know they play cleveland because they're playing the afc north uh they do have some tough games because they have atlanta they have um uh, giants uh, they um have tampa bay but even with all that i think they can get to seven and nine yep and uh speaking of that division next up we have the green bay packers their over under is 10 um, and you got to lay quite some money to get that hundred, hundred fifty dollars. Uh, so it's not, it's not going against the grain. But I have them just over at eleven and five. They did do things last year which worried me, and really, Aaron Rodgers would uh, dance his way to pulling them out of the fire in a bunch of games. I mean, we're talking uh, hail marys, you know, the old Aaron Rodgers way. Uh, they re-steadied themselves in the playoffs you know, up until the. Uh, the uh, conference championship, championship game. game, but uh, there is magic there. I think bringing in Martellus Bennett will be really good to have that safety valve tight end. Um, Jordy Nelson is obviously uh, there and uh, as healthy as ever at this point. So I do see them going 11 and five. I I would not be surprised though. They, they, they get themselves to the most underwhelming 10 and six you've ever seen. If you, if you think of it that way, last year just never felt that good, and they got to ten and six. They did, yeah. I mean, they and it took a lot at the end. I mean, I think people were, if you remember, in early November, people were talking about, uh, uh, you know, a coaching change in uh, in Green Bay, um, and then they went on that run and, uh, you know, got out the doorstep of the Super Bowl, uh, which I think for a lot of people would have been the dream Super Bowl, given 
the options on the table. Um, <laughs> so uh, I have them uh, a little bit better than you do, which I didn't go into it wanting to give them 12 wins. But when I looked at the schedule, went through it game by game, I wound up at 12 wins. So I could easily see them at 11, but uh, 12 is, is where they landed with me. Uh, and that's going up again against the pretty tough AFC North. But I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of confidence in what they can do. Next up, we have the Houston Texans. Their over-under is 8.5. I believe I had them getting 10 wins last year, and they ended up at 9. Um, and that was with a self-imploding, expensive quarterback. I think this year they're going to finish 9-7, and seven, but it was a tough one. They're, they, I felt like they had a tough schedule, um, and it's going to be a, a well-earned nine and seven and i believe there'll be a rising nine seven their defense is going to be great but there's something about when you hear about how great a defense is all the time it never really uh, the numbers stack up but it never materializes to me if you don't have a quarterback so um i mean we obviously saw it happen with peyton manning although he did do enough in that final year to keep things honest i do believe deshaun watson will be playing uh maybe a quarter into the season if not a little more and I think he's going to be a steadying force, and he will be really good. That's my that's my thought. So I do see them on the over at nine and seven. It's very uh, close there with an eight and a half. But um, if they're if that defense having three elite pass rushers on the same line, if that defense cannot get to nine wins, I don't know what can. Well, uh, I actually have them at I have the mirror image. I have them at seven and nine, and. <laughs> I, and I actually adjusted upward after my first go really? around with them. I did. Uh, and I have them falling into a bit of a tailspin at the end of the season as well, going on a losing streak. So I could see where they'll, in typical Houston fashion, uh, being competitive up until the very end, but then having it fall apart in the month of December for them. Uh, I just don't... Um, I just don't have uh, a lot of con- – I feel like Bill O'Brien always has one foot out the door. Um, J.J. Watt coming back from injury, that's – I'm always a little suspicious of that. Uh, the quarterback situation being what it is, um, you know, I, I'm not sold on uh, O'Brien – I'm sorry, Bill O'Brien. Bill O'Brien being a uh, quarterback guru. Uh, I know he did well as the offensive coordinator in – New England, I know he did well at Penn State with Hackenberg, but I just... But did he? I, <laughs> Who knows, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of like an undeserved reputation, possibly. So I uh, I just don't have the same confidence in the squad. And meanwhile, I think some other teams in their division have gotten a little bit better. Well, one I think has gotten worse, but I think the other two have improved. So I have them at 7-9, and nine, which feels like a very... Uh, you know, very Houston Texans like record to me. I feel like they've been like seven and nine, eight and eight, or nine and seven th- throughout the last like five to six years. And to show you how important a quarterback is, the Indianapolis Colts, their over under is nine. <laughs> it shows you right there. You can have like one of the most elite defenses ever, and you're at eight and a half. And then when you have an elite quarterback, you're at nine. A quarterback who we we th- are not even sure is going to play. <laughs> when if and Mm -hmm. they're at nine um and the money is on the under i have them on the under i had them getting to seven and nine uh somehow they still got to eight and eight last year i got them seven and nine but i wrote it could be much lower though i have at six and ten yeah so i do have them lower than than that uh i yeah we don't know when luck is going to play uh we know he's not going to play the first game and then you know they went and of course made the trade for the quarterback from the Patriots. Uh, I just you know they're playing the um, their schedules not easy, uh, not easy at all. They um, they uh, you know I mean Tennessee has gotten better. I think Jacksonville has gotten better. Um, although I said that last year too. Uh, I um, see that you know they have to play Arizona. They have to play. You know, a Rams team with a tough defense without luck is not easy. Um, and the GM was gone, and now the coach is still there. It's, yes. It just it's, has the feeling of a midseason firing. It kind of does. I know I, I like Pagano, and he's hung on for a while, um, but it does seem like this is a uh, – they need to sort of reset the entire organization, and they haven't protected Andrew Luck for the last few seasons. And I, I feel like that AFC 
title game appearance that they had uh, almost hurt the hurt the franchise because it let them believe that what they were doing was working more so than it was. But I think that uh, the chickens come home to roost, so to speak, a little bit with a six and ten season. Would Bruce Arians trade everything he has in Arizona to have Andrew Luck in Indianapolis? Depending on if he's healthy. I mean, I think he suffered some pretty serious injuries and maybe more so than they're even letting on. But if you have a healthy Andrew Luck, I don't think there are many franchises that wouldn't trade everything. Isn't that amazing with how good that team is on the whole? And you probably, and getting to live in Arizona in the winter, I think he still would probably take Andrew Luck in Indianapolis. I mean, quarterbacks, a lot of times these picks, you can just go up and down the line and vote on the quarterback. I mean, look how many times a quarterback makes us go over. (laughs) And how many mm-hmm. times a non uh, not having a quarterback makes us go under? It's not like we're going. Ooh, that defense might drop from like you know fourth rank to ninth. That's going to be the difference. No, it's can the guy yeah. take it at the end or in the major moments, and can he elevate what is a pretty much basic team? I almost think of a lot of these teams without quarterbacks. It's like cattle. You need cattle. Everything's great, uh, but you're not going to sit around and watch cows. Like you want to see the hyenas, you want to see the, the exotic animals. Those are the quarterbacks and the skill players. You need the cattle, but you don't want it. Yeah, and I think if you said you had a healthy Andrew Luck for the entire season, which nobody knows if they have a healthy quarterback for an entire season, but at least starting out, if you had Andrew Luck at his best, uh, I probably would move them up to eight and eight. So still not nine that though. Does go to show it. That's the amazing thing. No, nine, not nine. You gotta you gotta go at ten on the over. I mean, it's. I mean, Vegas knows stuff, though. That's the only thing. I mean, we only we were on either side of 500, you know, one win away, I think. I was one win over. You might have been one under. It's crazy how they just know. Um, mm-hmm. Next up, another team who wishes they had a quarterback and would probably trade it all, Jacksonville Jaguars. To have a team with this level of skill, and when I was looking at the uh, the position grouping rankings, they are ranked so highly in so many different facets and to have an over-under of 6.5 is a travesty. Um, I actually have them on the over, and I wrote in my notes, how do I see them going 9-7 and seven or 10-6? and six? What is wrong with me? Whoa, you have them at ten, 9 or 7 or 10 or 6? I wrote 9-7 and seven wow. or 10-6. and six. I think their team is so stacked, and I have a weird feeling about Blake Bortles. Now that everything... They've now that uh, popular opinion has almost moved so far past them. I could see him gunsling. He has so many skilled players, and they've added Leonard Fournette. I I have a weird feeling. I just have a weird feeling they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna be on the over. And I said I it was like when you said when you added it up and somehow you got to like twelve wins with a team. I added this up wow. and I got to nine and seven and I wrote nine and seven because I was too embarrassed to write ten and six. I felt the way you did last season about the Jacksonville Jaguars, <laughs> if you remember, and, and they let me down, so I, you know, fooled me once. Um, I do have them over, but I have them over only at seven and nine. Uh, I, for a lot of the same reasons that you pointed out, they do have so much talent, especially defensively, um, and but I, I just think that they're, and I also would say this: I think Tom Coughlin, from all indications, has started to change the culture of that organization and really professionalize it. Um, but I think that uh, the quarterback situation seems a little unsteady. I don't know what you're going to get out of that offense. Um, looking at their schedule, they don't have the toughest schedule in the world. They have to play Pittsburgh. They have to play you know, tennis, well, Tennessee twice, obviously, because they're in their division. Uh, Seattle, they have to play. Um, so yeah, Arizona, um, they've got a pretty tough schedule. So that's what's got me at 7-9 to nine with them. I think there is enough young talent there, but... Uh, I just don't think they have what it takes on the offense to uh, in that division with that schedule to get above seven. Well, and you're still on the over. <clears throat> I just, yes. I, I think that they're like the ultimate team who underachieves so long that everyone moves past them. And the other thing is the brand new coach makes a difference. I think if, if Gus Bradley is still there, there's sort of a pull over the team. Even though Doug Marone was around, he's now the head coach. Like you said, Coughlin came in. I think there's some things that Coughlin's presence does, like all the little cleanup, the five minutes early. Like a lot of those things make players focus 
um, on other things than idle time. And I just have a weird feeling. I just have a strange feeling Blake Bortles is going to (laughs) regress to the, uh, to his mean, uh, in a good way, or what would it be? Egress <laughs> or something? Uh, he's gonna he's gonna get back to the mean, and even at a even at a really crappy like mean level, he has so many skilled players, and that defense is really good. And they added more people, so I think um, I th- I think things are gonna be a little better than people think. You're on the over. I'm really on the over. This is my limb team. This was your limb team last year. I think it's going to work out better for me than it did last year for you. So um, next up. I wish you luck. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) Jacksonville Island. Um, Next up, we have the Kansas City Chiefs. This is a team who continually, they're like the uh, 90s Atlanta Braves. They just continually get their wins in regular seasons. They play above themselves. They have a manager quarterback. Then you get to the postseason and you need the, you know, you need the live arms. They don't have that, but they are a uh, they're a, a over under at nine. They just have a nice roster. Tyreek Hill um, burgeoned last year, and I have them just at the o- over. Uh, I really do have them getting to nine wins though, but I went on the over just to make sure I was uh, uh, I was I was going either way with it. I have them at ten and six, even though I counted nine. I want to be on the over. I actually am. A bigger fan of Kansas City than than you. I have them surprising myself at twelve and four. Wow, uh, which which feels high, feels very high, especially when they're in the same division as Denver and Oakland. But I went through it and um, landed at twelve. I think just this is a solid team, very well coached team. Even you know, I'm interested to see what happens with the quarterback situation. I think there are people who are itching to get Mahomes in there. Um, but Alex Smith, he's a good quarterback at the end of the day. I mean, it, what's the, <laughs> if I told you that in 2017, Alex Smith would be a starter on a team that is uh, almost guaranteed to make the playoffs and Colin Kaepernick would be out of the league, uh, that's probably something a lot of people wouldn't have believed, uh, given how things ended in San Francisco. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I feel good about this team, I think. I, it feels. I mean, I don't. I'm probably going to regret the 12 and four. It's probably closer to 10 and six than 12 and four. But um, that's where I landed when I went through the schedule. See, and the funny thing is, when you look at their position rankings, they're not that far away from Jacksonville. That's what I'm saying. Like, um, they their uh, their quarterback ranking is a 23. I think Jacksonville was a 27. Their front seven is a four. Their DBs are a six. I think Jacksonville was eight and eight in those. Um, you know, obviously out of the thirty-two teams, uh, their skill players are really good. So are Jacksonville's. I think if Andy Reid took over Jacksonville, don't you think that that's? I, I just I don't understand the talent that's there and the people they've still added. And I think having a new team, I, I think we're saying a lot of the same things about Jacksonville. Um, and Bortles probably has more upside than Alex Smith. But if Alex Smith is the quarterback of Jacksonville, does that change what you think about their team? I think it does. I think it does. Why the quarterback and also uh, the continuity that Reed has brought to Kansas City over the last few seasons, if you could. He's Bobby Cox, right? I mean, this it's unbelievable, this guy. If you could give me a few seasons of that in Jacksonville, then I'd be higher on Jacksonville. But I don't, I don't know if, if Reed is quick fix Jacksonville. Um, it's more that you know this the record that I'm projecting for Kansas City is the culmination of what he has built there over the last several seasons. Exactly. Next up, we have the Los Angeles Chargers. It is hard having two L.A teams here because I'm looking at LAC, LAR when the team, you mm-hmm. know, and for the other teams and I'm like, wait, I have to remind myself who's who. And they both underachieved last year uh, for different reasons. But the Los Angeles Chargers, they're over under a seven and a half. And I'm on, I'm with the money because uh, I would have to lay 135 to win a hundred, but I have them just over at eight and eight. I thought I could do more, but I I felt their schedule was tough. I thought the certain travel was tough. And I think there is something, just like we said with the Rams last year, there's something to being in a new 
uh, in a, in a new place where the whole season feels like a road game until you're getting comfortable with where you're living. Yeah, especially when there are only thirty five thousand fans. Yeah, that's the <laughs> in your stadium. Um, I have uh, the Chargers at six and ten. <clears throat> um, again, they're playing with Oakland. They're playing with uh, Kansas City. Two teams I'm high on. Um, they also are playing the NFC East, so they've got to play the Giants. They've got to play the Cowboys. Um, they also play New England. Um, I just have them at six and ten. I think they've got a pretty competitive schedule. I don't know. You know, I, I I do kind of subtract a game or two for the move on a team. I think that that uh, does hurt a franchise. This also feels like a franchise that didn't want to move, uh, but whose owners just kind of forced it upon them. Um, and it, how it, crappy it is it to move like right there too? Like at least St. Louis, they moved yeah. across the halfway across the country. You're like moving from San Diego to LA and sort of you're going to, isn't Carson South of LA? So you're not even, um, that removed. Yeah. yeah even, like yeah. what a we like you have to leave your home basically, but it's close enough I to would, feel tantalizing. I mean, of all of the relocations of the last, however many we can go back to like 95, 96 when Rams and other teams moved Oakland, I think moved, um, this, this feels like the worst move to me. Chargers to LA just feel like there's nothing about it that makes sense to me. And it just, it feels wrong on so many levels. So maybe I'm making an emotional pick, but I think they're just at six and 10 and they're breaking in a new coach too. Um, so uh, just, I feel like this is, you know, the, I mean, this is an organization who probably is looking at Philip Rivers. He doesn't, you know, what's next after Philip Rivers. He may not necessarily like playing outside of San Diego, uh, he's got some mileage on him, um, so they might be thinking, looking into the draft to, uh, to find his replacement. So um, yeah, they may not be disappointed with six and ten. If you're not going to make the playoffs, uh, you got a quarterback rich draft, then maybe winning games actually hurts you. So uh, six and ten just feels like where they are. Well, their defense is on the come too. Joey Bosa is getting a lot of uh, plaudits about being like the. Uh third or fourth fourth best um path pass rusher in the uh in the league so uh we'll have to see that but um yeah i think certainly certainly the under um or no i have them on the so i'm on the over you're on the under so that's one of the mm-hmm. that's one of the uh, binary choices there between us um next up we have the los angeles rams they're at uh five and a half I have them on the over at six and ten, and it's a to me it's because of a tough schedule because they were very um, competitive. Especially, I think they were three and one in the first four. They obviously mm-hmm. beat that really ugly game. Uh, they beat the uh, Seattle Seahawks in that really ugly game that was like nine to three or something, and put some doubt into people's. Uh, you know, you know, um, Seattle has these awful games because their offensive line can be so shaky. That if it's especially having a bad day, you're just shot as an offense. Like everything's gone. So uh, L.A. still has the defense to uh, to do big things. It'll be really interesting to see what Jared Goff does this year. They obviously brought in Sammy Watkins from Buffalo, and uh, this is it because they brought in the coach for for the quarterback. Uh, the the quarterback only gets one coach, and. Um, I mean, he's already on two. Wade Phillips is there. And by the way, I forgot to mention, you see who the defensive coordinator of San Diego is? Gus Bradley. Who is it? Oh, (laughs) Gus Bradley. And did you see who the offensive coordinator of Denver is? I did indeed. Yeah, Mike McCoy. (laughs) Mike McCoy, your favorite guy. Um, So I got them at six and 10. Again, tough schedule, but I think it's going to be an overachieving six and 10 that gets me on the over. Where do you see him? I have them just on the under at five and eleven, okay. uh, which I might regret. But um, yeah, just going through it, I just think that uh, I, I know some people are expecting progress. I will expect. I think you'll see some progress, but that progress may not necessarily reveal itself in the wins and losses. Uh, I, I, I think it'll be five and eleven, but I. I I have a sense it's going to feel like a good five and eleven as opposed to a bad five and eleven. Um, like the Chargers at six and ten, that's sort of a bad six and ten. Whereas the Rams five and eleven probably feels like it's building towards something. And I think there'll be a trendy pick heading into two thousand eighteen, but it just feels a year too soon for them for me. 
Wade Phillips in there as the uh, defensive coordinator. Um, next up, we have the Miami Dolphins, who um, Brian Tannehill went down, and out of the broadcast booth came Jay Cutler. And everybody's talking about Jay Cutler. Oh, he's back with Adam Gase. What an amazing time. The one guy who figured him out. What was his record, Tim, the year he played with Adam Gase? Uh, I believe it was was six and nine. Six and ten. Oh, six and nine. (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah, because he didn't play, I think, the last game. So that's the beauty of Jay Cutler right there is that we're sitting here going, oh, my God, the guy figured it out at six and nine, and he made a lot of money. And uh, those are the kinds of – you know, those are the kinds of values and expectations we'd all like. Uh, I do worry. I think he's got a black cloud aspect to him. I think he'll make some throws where you go, wow, in the Miami sun. Uh, and by the way, the first game looks like it won't be in Miami. It was supposed to be, I think, Tampa That's Bay right. going there. They might play in Philadelphia that. or Pittsburgh. That's kind of neat. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have them at eight and eight just on the over because I think they're, they got they have good players and they're, they're going to have some moments and uh, they brought in Julius Thomas, right? Who was the old, uh, all these guys with Gase. Gase is like this, this, this whisperer, this great coach. I just love the rise and fall of coaches, but they brought in Julius Thomas who had gone to Jacksonville um, when Jacksonville was trying to get everybody from Denver for a few years. And then now he's in Miami. So Jay Cutler will have every opportunity to lead a team to the playoffs but I see them going eight and eight and uh, a lot of people uh, sports illustrated, I think had them at seven and nine, but I have them eight and eight. There are some tough schedule aspects and they're going to look bad. They're going to look good. And they're also going to look over match at times. Um, I'm not buying the uh, Cutler resurgence. I have them at nine and seven, which surprises me. Uh, I didn't want to have them at nine and seven. Um, and nine and seven, by the way, gets them into the playoffs for me with the AFC, which I really didn't want. But that's how it worked out uh, with Jay Cutler. It's it's interesting. I know a lot of people compare him to Jeff George, that he is the Jeff George of his generation. Uh, I think that's a little unfair. But uh, if you recall, Jeff George did wind up in Minnesota after he flamed out in Atlanta and did uh, – lead the Vikings to a pretty good year uh, when he did come back. So maybe this is this is Jay Cutler's uh, Minnesota year, like Jeff George had. So I, um, yeah, for me, that not, I got them to 9-7, and seven not because of Jeff, uh, Jay Cutler, but uh, almost despite Jay Cutler. Uh, I, you know, he's better than the option they had uh, when, um, you know, their quarterback went down. So, um they could have been a lot worse, but uh, I, yeah, I, I'm almost I'm, I'm mystified by my selection of nine and seven. Um, but that's where I wound up. Well, they got they, they don't feel like a team that that's going to. When I saw them last year, I didn't feel like it was a team that had it figured out in terms of multiple consecutive playoff runs. Uh, but more or less, they were sort of a one-off team who would then sort of dip a little bit, maybe the next season, and then come, you know, have a resurgence the following season. That. That's what they struck me as in terms of their identity. But um, for whatever reason, I got him at 9-7. Well, he will be behind a very good offensive line. Eighth ranked. Uh, first round pick Laramie Tunzel has really um, settled in there. I always wish the Giants got him last year. Uh, Bong notwithstanding. <laughs> what a weird thing that was. Oh, my mm-hmm. God. But uh, he will have every shot. I just I, I feel like I always see Jay Cutler – just getting sacked like a rag doll. So maybe he'll get some protection. And uh, he sort of needs to get them to the playoffs because he might have given up a great bar- broadcasting job. Although I do love when people are like, they're never going to give it back. It's like, yes, they will. If he was yes, good, if he was yeah. good uh, and, and they knew he was going to be a good, if they were going to hire him once, they're not going to begrudge him for going back and playing the league. If anything, that's a better story for them when he comes back. It's like, come on. It gives him more intel to talk about. He got to play for the next, you know, quote unquote, big coach, and he gets to give the intel on that. So I don't know. I think that's that's kind of garbage. Um, as you said, Jeff George in Minnesota. Next up, we have Minnesota. They uh, they're at an eight and a half on the over under. We're all a little worried about Minnesota because of how hot things started. It looked like they got the better quarterback deal of it all when Bridgewater went down, and they brought in Bradford, and the defense was under the Zimmer mode, and they were taking care of teams. It looked like they were going to be on their way to a Super Bowl, basically. 
and it all fell apart and they ended up eight and eight, I believe. So we're looking at, um, a team who you've seen a Jekyll and Hyde. I don't know if you could trust it. I do really like the addition of Dalvin cook. I'm really looking forward to watching him, but again, it's not Cutler level, but there's something that just bothers me about Bradford and, uh, and, and winning. He's made all the money in the world, sort of like Cutler did, but he just does enough to look okay, but not enough to kind of break out of yourself and win. It's really been quite an underachieving career. And maybe when it seemed like things were going to achieve injuries happened. So uh, long story short, I have them still at the over, but at nine and seven. Oh, uh, I'm at six and 10, <clears throat> which is probably way too harsh on my part. Watch Sports Illustrated has them at 11 and five. I know. Um, <clears throat> so I'm probably gonna, really going to regret this. No, you know, my thesis, it's because they did the huge cover story on Zimmer and like they bought into it so much. Not that you can't buy into it. He's a really, you know, really good coach. But I think sometimes you drink the Kool-Aid if you're spending too much time with someone. So, uh, yeah, I think that they're, I don't know. I went through the schedule. I saw nine and seven. I had a hard time getting to 11 and five or 10 and six. So I felt okay with it because it was still on the over. It gives me some room to go um, even over that. But I just, there's some, there's some uncertainty with, with what happened uh, last year. And you actually, I, you would only have to lay, you, you can lay uh lesser money on the over, which is crazy. Like it's crazy. You, I mean, I'm, I'm calling you crazy. Um, most people you love, you love Zimmer though. <laughs> you love his defenses. Um, like, what do you think is going to go wrong? I mean, you, you think it's Bradford. You think he's going to get injured? Um, was it I, the schedule? Are you, schedule. cause I forgot about oh. cook. I forgot about cook. He's great. He is great. I, I'm just going up and down the schedule, and um, I still feel pretty good about my picks. I mean, maybe it's a seven and nine. Maybe, maybe they stretch to eight and eight, but I don't see them being Atlanta. I don't see them beating um, uh, Green Bay uh, twice I, or, or even once. I don't see them uh, beating Pittsburgh. Um, possibly, maybe I'm too high on Tampa Bay. I don't see that win happening. Um, so, like, they get their six wins by beating a New Orleans team, by beating Cleveland, by beating. Um, uh, Chicago twice uh, by being Cincinnati. So, like, I think they'll get pick up those wins when it, I mean, being the Rams, but I just, I, yeah, I think uh, game to game, I think they're staring at 10 losses. I just, it's one of those things where sometimes I think of the narrative through a season, even though, you know, you can't predict the future. And I think there's, it could all go wrong, but it feels like with me, Zimmer has a lot of job security. Uh, and I, my thought is if it ends up where you have them, uh, I almost, my head can't support that narrative that, uh, that he's not going to find a way to get the team to be more competitive. I think Bradford has too much on him. I mean, he must be a free agent after this year. So I think he might have a good year because of that. I could almost see them doing a nine and seven, and not making the playoffs, maybe, which is like the perfect Bradford year. <laughs> mm-hmm. He does enough to get the contract and to make you think that it's on the upswing. Um, and then, uh, but he doesn't have to actually go into the big spotlight moment. He's never made the playoffs, right? I don't think he. Um, I don't think he has. Let me think about that. No, he did. Yeah, no, because his rookie year, he uh, they almost made the playoffs um, when. Spagnuolo was his coach, and but they ended up losing. I think the final game to Seattle, so Seattle ended up uh, making the playoffs instead. You know, and he's he's going to be thirty years old, November eighth. I mean, that's maybe he is Jeff George. <laughs> no, he's not. But um, you no, know, he, I don't think he's Jeff George. No, no, no. He doesn't have the arm. Um, so yeah, all right. Well, that's another point of uh, difference for us. Next up, we have. I bet you we have a difference here. We have the New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. As I said, I think because of the winning, and look, to the victors go the spoils, but because of winning the two out of the last three Super Bowls, um, because of starting last season with two other quarterbacks, uh, one getting injured, the next guy coming in looking like you're unbeatable, I actually believe we're overvaluing New England a little bit. I just, I just think that way. 
And the minute you start overvaluing something, there's cracks. The NFL is too even between the teams to anoint someone to win at the levels of like a 14 and two, 14 and two is hard. Um, and it's almost unnecessary sometimes as well. But I think the two out of the three super last three Super Bowls is difficult. As I said, they were in perilous straits. They were on the goal line about to lose. And then last year they're down 25 in the third. They did everything they could to win all the credit to them. But I think there's a little bit of an overvalue. Long story short, I have them at the under. I still have them going 11 and five, but I feel like 12 and a half is a lot. And even getting to 12 wins gets me on the under, but I went through the games and I just don't think the need to win every single game in what at parts I found to be kind of a tough schedule. Um, I mean, I can see them losing at New Orleans. Like I could almost see that like Eli Manning game from two years ago where it's like 52-49. Tom Brady shows you he's got the seven uh, touchdown passes, all that stuff. I think that their schedule was tough enough and they're not going to have to win 14 or 13 games. So I had them at 11 and five. What about you? I have them at 13 and three. Um, I was, no, you've been reading, I think a lot about, uh, this Patriots team again going undefeated through the regular season, which I, with which I completely disagree. <laughs> That's not happening. I actually think it would be to their benefit to lose uh, along the way. Um, you know, I, I actually give them a loss uh, somewhat early in their schedule, but uh, they have to play Pittsburgh. Um, they have to play Oakland, I believe, in Oakland. Um, those are two tough games. KC to start the year is not going to be no, that's not easy. An easy game. Houston um, plays them well. Carolina is going to be wanting to be on an upswing. They're going to be playing in New England. It's a they do have they, they have the Super Bowl rematch with Atlanta. Um, it's, it just works out that way this year. So uh, you know they have Denver. Denver's got a good D as we've talked about. Uh, but even with all that, I still have them at thirteen and three. But eleven and five doesn't. I wouldn't be surprised if they if they fell to eleven and five. So um, and Tom but, Brady's forty. Or, I mean, is there a chance that we're kind of uh, and Edelman's out for the year. I know everyone's going to say it's not going to matter. Everyone's into this Burkhead, Bunkhead guy or whatever. Well, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I think the thing with them is just, it's just that they've got their own division so figured out um, that they just coast through their own division, um, which just gives them such a cushion. So that is probably part of why uh, someone like me would give them the 13 wins. But uh, yeah, I mean, look, the, the Brady Belichick, obviously five Super Bowls. You can't argue with that, um, having gone to seven Super Bowls. But there have been some ebbs along the way as well. You know, there, there was uh, a span between uh, their Super Bowl win against Philadelphia and then the Super Bowl loss against the Giants where things were a little up and down. And then even after uh, a couple of losses to the Giants, uh, things have been up and down. So they may be due for uh, a bit of a, uh, of a drop-off, but... Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm also not as I, I'm not as concerned about the Edelman loss. Uh, I think that that they can they can teach a player to play like Edelman. It's not like uh, you know Charles. Uh, now you got me saying Charles Johnson, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Megatron back in Detroit, yeah. Calvin Johnson. Um, <laughs> you know, losing Calvin Johnson. Um, you know, that's a unique player. You can't replace a Calvin Johnson, but I, I feel like you can replace an Edelman. Um, so. I, I think they'll ride it out. They've got that said. They have their division figured out, and I think they're going to end up at uh, around thirteen and three. It's amazing they were fourteen and two last year, but twelve and four, 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 thirteen and three. I mean, yeah, it's insane. It's insane winning. Um, next up, we have the New Orleans Saints, who are always basically. We could almost run back the preview from last year or every year for the last handful of years. They're always. Uh, pretty dominant at home and it's always a track meet and then they go on the road and things are tougher they don't have a great defense often but they did some things to shore uh the defense up they brought in adrian peterson who uh it's going to be strange to see him there and it's either going to work or it's going to look like emmett smith in uh, arizona but i think the fact that it's almost the expendables a little bit you got drew Brees at his advanced age you have um, Adrian Peterson at his relative advanced stage for a running back. 
There, I, I think there could be some magic in that bottle this year. So long story short, they're an over under of eight. I actually have them on the over going nine and seven. <clears throat> I don't. I have them at six and ten. <laughs> I uh, I just think this is this is a franchise that needs a change. Um, like Sean Payton, obviously what he's done with that organization, he's made them, he's given them a level level of credibility they never had without him. But I don't think they've done enough in the off season to shore up their weaknesses. And I think that Breeze has gotten the year older. I'm not expecting much out of Adrian Peterson. Um, so I think the weaknesses that they've been showing for the last several years remain. And I've got, I've got them at six and ten. Isn't it amazing at his age, though, he's like the sixth-ranked quarterback potentially still? Yeah, his age and his size. Let's for, not forget that. And I his mean, injury. Came into, yeah, his injury. I mean, he's when he came into the league, people, you know, he fell to the second round just because of his size and then, of course, his injury. And um, he's had an amazing career. So, I mean, I'm a big Drew Reese fan, but uh, I just feel like they're just kind of going through the motions now in New Orleans. Yeah, it's like the barnstorming tour. You know, it's like mm-hmm. the uh, let's let's watch him play. Let's see the offense like a video game. Next up, we have our New York Giants, who have a Heard pretty it. high over under at nine wins. Um, you have to lay money on either end of it because there's a lot of people probably betting with New York, but um, they have a tough tough schedule as usual. I actually have them going nine and seven right at the number but i'm going over because i obviously root for them their defense is insanely good it's going to be another year um together landon collins stepped up to stepped up as maybe the best defensive player in all football almost and uh or best secondary at least most dynamic guy can score you touchdowns and he did he covered a lot for their offense which was surprisingly weak at times um there's a lot of discussion that uh, Eli Manning has really made concessions to age, but has been covered up by the aforementioned skill players on offense. They drafted the uh, tight end out of uh, Ole Miss, Ingram. They've um, added Brandon Marshall, which will be interesting. And maybe we can finally break the uh, streak of Brandon Marshall never being in the NFL playoffs. That would be nice. He's like 34 years old at this point. So um, I'm rooting for more, but I actually, and maybe because I'm a fan, I was very conservative in breaking the schedule down. They do have a tough schedule too. I see them going nine and seven, but I'm going on the over because I don't want to. I don't want to see that come true. I still think they'll make the playoffs at that, but um, I was also annoyed because Sports Illustrated had the Giants making it a ten and six, winning the division, and then um, playing a home game with the Packers and then saying the Packers beats, beat the Giants in MetLife. I wouldn't see that happening. I think that the Giants would have the home field advantage there, much as uh, Green Bay ultimately did uh, up there in Lambeau. But, uh, you know, I'm happy to see them make it, but I hate when you look at those previews and right away they have the team out. So I do have them on the over, rooting for that, but I have them at 9-7. and seven. How about you? I have them at 10-6, and, <clears throat> and I went in with a conservative leaning um knowing that they are my team i i I wanted to be fair about this uh tough schedule they have to you know travel oakland which is not easy um have to travel denver which is not easy um and you know they got tampa bay uh they have arizona so um with all but their home schedule is a little easier although seattle does come to uh, metlife stadium um still have the ten and six really just largely because of the defense but uh, jury's out for me with the offense. Uh, have not really liked what I've seen. I know some people are talking that McAdoo needs to give up play calling duties. Um, I don't know if something happens this season that nudges him in that direction or not. Um, obviously, like when you talk about the Giants, usually the first point is defense looks great, especially the secondary. Second point is offensive line. Why didn't they fix it? Um, I think it seems like the organization's position has been to let the offensive line grow uh, especially flowers and let them grow into the position a little bit um uh you know they do have a great center so i mean uh, weston richburg has turned into a very very good center um so I, I i'm not i have i have not been as down on the offensive line as some of the critics have been over the last couple of years but i still would have liked to have seen them be a little bit more aggressive in how they improved it um i'm very happy to see 
what I have in terms of the defense, not even in terms of with respect to the starters, but also in terms of how they have uh, stocked the backups. Um, I feel like they've got, uh, um, you know, they have more depth than they did last year. Uh, the pick they just got, the pickup they just got from uh, Pittsburgh certainly speaks to that in the cornerback position. So overall, um, they look like, you, you say nine and seven, I say 10 and six. I could see either one happening. Uh, I'm just, I think with the defense that they've had and have, how well they performed and how well Spagnuolo has had them playing, that uh, that will carry them through to you know above 500. Do you think Eli is the reason they don't get 12 wins? I, well, you could look at it both ways. He could be the reason why they don't get 12 wins, and also a reason why they win a Super Bowl at the same time <laughs> in the same in the, in the same season. But um, no, I don't. I. It it is strange to me because he seemed to have made this is what his fourth year year in McAdoo's offense or fifth year in McAdoo's offense. Uh, um, was it twelve that he came in? Um, two thousand. I think it was. I think it's his fourth year. Yeah. Uh, so that being the case, like first year, uh, yeah, I think it's his fourth year. First year took some adjustment, but he he was positive. At the second year, I think he played. You know, he adapted to it, but then he. It just seemed like there was a disconnect between the game plan and his approach or his skill set last year, and I, it didn't. It, it felt fixable. It felt like with with each passing game, he the adjustment could be made and it could catch on. Um, but and, and look, he played very well in that playoff game in Green Bay. That was not his fault. No, he the, did. The, yeah, you know, he played well. Yeah, rece- receivers drop those balls. Receivers catch a few of those balls early on. It doesn't turn into the steamroll that uh, that occurred. So. Um, you know, I'm never going to count out Eli Manning. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I feel like, I don't know. I just feel like something wasn't clicking last year with that offense. Um, and maybe, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I can't look at any acquisitions or additions that they've made in the off season that says to me like, okay, that's going to do it or that's going to fix it. Um, you know, because even the, the tight end whom they drafted feels more like another receiver. Uh, so uh, we'll see. But I, I'm i not going to lay the blame at uh, Eli Manning's feet. I feel like sometimes maybe in the McAdoo offense there's a little too much precision needed from Eli. And really his great moments are when he's sandlot heaving it. <laughs> and I almost want to see more of these, these deep balls. He throws a beautiful deep ball and uh, Beckham... Beckham can catch him. And it'll be interesting also to see Brandon Marshall going deep and jumping up over guys. And he throws, like, really, Eli's at his best when he's throwing the deep ball down the sides and when he's throwing to the tight end over the middle. When he's doing these precise slant routes, and, and sometimes it can work, but the dink and dunks or the precise, precise um, you know, slant routes, I just get worried, Eli, with precision close. Uh, and I, it, it feels like there's a lot more of that in the McAdoo offense. There does, and he, uh, but he seemed to have adjusted well to it his second season of that offense. Uh, it's just that there was this this drop off last season, um, which just seemed a little inexplicable to me. Maybe it is age. Maybe it is the offensive line rushing him um, that he. Uh, uh, it doesn't have the protection that he needs. Uh, I'm not sure. He's still through for four thousand yards. And he's never thrown for 5,000. He got to 4,900 in uh, 2011. But uh, I also did a statistic where, so he threw 35 touchdowns two years ago and he threw 26 last year. So not the level you want to be at 30. But if I, I said, if you, if you swapped the two new Orleans games, right? So the new Orleans game in 2015, where it was the track meet 52, 49 mm-hmm. loss. I think he threw like seven touchdowns. And then in 2016 last year, remember the one where it was like a defensive battle that yes. they won at the very end. It was like one touchdown. If you swap the two uh, seasons, Eli has something like um, 29 touchdowns the year before, or no, like, maybe 30 or something. It was basically the same amount of touchdowns if you just change out one game. So one game against the same opponent. So a lot of times these numbers don't look as um, as starkly different. But again, the eye test, as you said, is a little different. We'll see, though. He has a lot of weapons. Uh, keep does. them healthy. I hope Beckham, everything looks, he looks okay now to play. 
Uh, I haven't seen that. Have you noticed if he's looking okay to play? Uh, I have not seen if it's confirmed or not, but um, you know, I've heard the rumblings, but I think I, I'm expecting him to play. Yeah, so um, that will be that will be key there. I'd love I'd love to put him in the. I've always said I'd love to put him in the backfield a little, but maybe he'll take a little more heat uh, there. Next up, we have the local yokel New York Jets at a staunch four and a half over under. They sold everything. They did, um, and I, of course, I do have them on the under, and I may be generous at three and thirteen. I have a three and thirteen too, and I have them like winning a late season game to break the hearts of their fans to get them to three and thirteen, as opposed to giving them outright the worst record in the league, having them tie with Chicago for the worst record in the league. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, there's not really much to say here. There's not a lot of talent. Whatever talent they have had, they've tried to like ship out. <laughs> uh, quarterback situation is what it is. Um, you know, I, the Hackenberg pick is probably going to live in infamy, unfortunately, to waste uh, that high a pick on a player like that who Oof. may may not really ever give you anything in the regular season. Um, and uh, as opposed to the preseason, that was not as opposed to the playoffs. Uh, <laughs> and um, look, they're, they're I they're playing for they're playing for the draft. They are, and they did sign or they did uh, acquire or sign two. K last name uh, wide receivers. They brought in Curse from Seattle, and then they just signed old friend Jeremy Curley uh, mm. today to come back home. He, mm, good uh, luck with that. Yeah, we'll see how that goes when you don't have a quarterback. He was just he just got done talking all this junk about Chan Gelly's offense and how it was the unhappiest time in his life. And Chan Gelly's gone, but Jeremy Curley he is back. There's not much to talk about there. Next up, Oakland, the uh, trendy pick to continue their ascent. Um, they are they are at a lofty over under of ten. Um, mm-hmm. I had trouble with this one because I I the, look ten is tough. I have them going ten and six, so I didn't know quite. That's a hard one to choose where to go over under because uh, I have them at ten and six, but I did say over. Um, they got a tough, they got a tough run. There's a little bit of distrust, I think, with their team and managing prosperity. Um, so I do have them at 10, six, but I'm going to go on the over, uh, very exciting team. They got a little taste last year. Of course, Derek Carr got hurt, but, um, yeah, I got them 10 and six on the over. I'm at 12 and four. Okay. So I'm over as well. Uh, pretty far over. Uh, Zen, they play with Kansas City. That is a tough division. Also with Denver in there. <clears throat> they play the NFC East. But even with all that said, I think they have as much talent on both sides of the ball as any team in this league. And um, I think Jack Del Rio did a great job with him last season. I don't think he got enough credit for the job that he did. Uh, but for Derek Carr's injury, I think they could have uh, advanced at least one more round of the playoffs, uh, which is really important for a team, a young team like this. Um, McKenzie has done a very good job putting this team together uh, under some difficult circumstances. But uh, I just think they're strong on both sides. I don't really see too many weaknesses with uh, the Oakland Raiders. Yeah, now they should be very good. Next up, we have the Philadelphia Eagles who I felt a little surprised were at an eight uh, over and over under. I felt like that's asking a lot. They did bring in some weapons for Carson Wentz. We should see some progression in his game. He started strong, but then I think over the last 10 or 12 games, he was the 29th worst quarterback by numbers um, and analytics and all that. But I have them going six and 10. I think it's another learning year. They're going to show some steps. He'll show some maybe more consistency over the longer term of the season. His weapons will come to bear, but I still see them at 6-10 and 10 because somebody has to get the losses for these other teams to uh, <laughs> to win. It's funny you should say that. I also have them at 6-10. and 10. Um, And uh, I think it was between uh, Philadelphia and Washington. I could have given a better record to one of the Giants division teams. And I decided to give it to Washington in this instance, uh, just because they are a young team still coming together, young quarterback. 
uh, coach in his second season putting it together. A coach who I still feel like doesn't quite have the complete confidence of the ownership, by the way. Uh, so uh, I don't know why that is. I thought he did a decent enough job under the circumstances, especially changing the culture that Chip Kelly had left behind. So um, I have them at six and ten, but I feel like it's it's that's a you know the, you can have two types of six and ten seasons. You can have a positive or a negative. I feel like this is a positive six and ten season where they'll take some um, learning experiences away from it and head into the off season uh, with some momentum. But uh, I still that's that's where I have them landing. Yeah, I'm very I'm very surprised that. Philadelphia was a half game up on uh, Washington, but we'll hit that uh, down the line mm-hmm. a little bit. Next up, we have Pittsburgh, who is another team expected to do very big things. They probably have the most prolific, um, impressive looking offense in the entire league. That doesn't always bear out because you only have, you know, there's only one ball for everybody, but man, is it scary. And there's also some. I think uh, issues with some of these players and what they might be doing off the field, which can derail things. I think there's an issue now with Ben Roethlisberger getting a little older. Some things can happen. He can be out a handful of games, but I think all told um, everyone on the, on the, on the uh, field together, their defense has gotten a lot better. Somehow they were able to get Joe Hayden after Cleveland's like, we're just going to kind of cut this guy they're really good. Um, over under is ten and a half. I did have them on the under, but it's at ten and six. So I think it's a very good season. Um, I think the offense will be prolific. I just had a hard time with the competitiveness of their division and their schedule, um, leaping them up uh, uh, higher in the rankings. I still think even in their losses, it's going to be heart pounding and uh, you know high scoring. But I had them at ten and six. <clears throat> I'm very top heavy with my AFC teams <laughs> and this is uh, ve- like way too top heavy. It's kind of amateurish, but I have them at 12 and four. <laughs> I have them at 12 and four. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with that. I've got, it's like a Ponzi got, like, three... scheme. Where are the law? Where are the teams that are, <laughs> I know, how are they like, all winning? At 12 and four in the NFC and, and, and the AFC and one with at, like 13 and three. But, um, yeah, they uh, got them at 12 and four, even though they are in a tough division. I just think their offense, I feel like we didn't see their best last season. That it didn't, the engine didn't rev the way that it was supposed to. They they hit some bumps, but I feel like this season it's ready to really um, get out on the road and uh, open up a bit. So that's my feeling about Pittsburgh. I probably always overestimate Pittsburgh because of their shared DNA with the Giants. Uh, they're they're my <laughs> AFC team, thanks to that. So um, you know, but they also, I mean, they play Chicago, they play Jacksonville, they play. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they also have some time. I mean, they have to play Green, Green Bay. Bay at home. That That's yeah. one of those shootout games. I think that that is Green they Bay also play New, wins. New England, which is like an emotional game for them because I know New England is, is, is the monkey on their back, um, so to speak. But uh, even with all that, and they also play Kansas City, which is not an easy game. Um, but even with all that, I still have them uh, netting out a 12 and 4. Okay. <laughs> my, my, I'm going to have a. <laughs> It's going to be the first time an 11 and 5 team didn't make the playoffs. The games. <laughs> Things are working for That's right. The first 12 and 4 team to. Team not to make the playoffs. Wait, <laughs> how, what did we, what, how, how did we, everyone go 14 and 2? Wait, was New England 11? Yeah, New England was 11 and 5 and they, when they didn't make the playoffs. Am I, am I wrong? Like a few years ago with uh, oh, several the, years ago. The one with Castle? Years ago. With, yeah, with yeah, Castle. that was 11 and 5. It was 11 and 5. Yeah, okay. So it's amazing. So that, that was the first 11 and 5 team. <laughs> It'll be the first twelve and four team not to make it. Next up, the first three and thirteen team to make the playoffs. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, San Francisco 49ers. Um, their over under is four and a half. The uh, Chip Kelly era came to a very fast end, uh, just about as fast as his uh, spread hurry up offense. And um, <clears throat> I had a hard time. No matter who they bring in as a coach, there's something about. I would have rather had Ryan Fitzpatrick in the offense than uh, Brian Hoyer. Um, I, also, another point, with what the Jets ended up doing, were things so bad that they couldn't just sign Ryan Fitzpatrick again? I know I know it was a bad season, but like Luke McCown is not better than Ryan Fitzpatrick. He is not, no. Well, I mean, uh, why didn't they just sign him? He's just a backup with uh, Jameis Winston now. He's getting all his FaceTime on uh, Hard Knocks. 
Uh, well, one, I don't think they want it to be better. <laughs> um, and then two, perhaps just in the locker room, they wanted to make a change. And, uh, I mean, they got rid of all those receivers. So I keep the same quarterback around. Oh, true. Um, um, you know, it's like starting fresh. So to them, probably McCown's the same as Ryan Fitzpatrick and maybe they got him cheaper. I guess that's true. Well, I do have San Francisco. I don't see a lot there. It's not very uh, exciting. Uh, their defense still has so- a little something to it, but man, they got they got a they got a long way up the mountain again. I still have them at three and thirteen. I was a little surprised the four. I know <laughs> to say you're surprised at four and a half, but um, I guess you don't see lower very often. Actually, that's sort of the bottom of the barrel. But um, yeah, I don't I don't see them. I don't see them doing much this year. They're going to provide a lot of the losses for a lot of these teams. They I saw. Are. Yeah. I, I had them at two and 14 and I wanted to find them another victory somewhere as I was going through it. And I just couldn't. Um, and that's mm. where they, they were. So I wouldn't be surprised if they did three and 13. Well, you know, what's um, terrible. You know who I see losing to them, the giants, like it's one of those oh, games yeah. where the Giants, they have to go over to, uh, they have to go to San Francisco. San Francisco. Probably a late game. Yeah. You're tired. And don't the Giants actually have to go to, let's see, was it San Francisco? They have to go to San Francisco and Oakland. And they can't even be mm-hmm. on, uh, they can't even be like on back to back weeks or anything where they could at least stay out there. That actually might yeah. be where they pay more than, uh, than being the first time. But I could see that being one of those overlooked games. When you're between the mm-hmm. Rams at home and then KC at home and then on the road in Washington. So uh, as bad as it is to say, and maybe that's how I got to nine and seven with the Giants, but I had uh, them maybe losing to San Francisco. San Francisco comes up and tries to uh, exercise their ghosts of uh, ghosts that are no longer in the building in any regard fighting for nobody. Hmm. Yeah, no, two and 14. I want to find them another victory. Maybe uh, maybe I will before I go to bed tonight uh, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> but uh, where it is, as of right this moment, I have them at two and 14. Next up, we have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, don't we have Seattle? Sorry, we have Seattle. I missed that one. Um, their over-under is 10 and a half. 10 and a half is a tough bet. It's almost like you want to walk away. Even if you think they're going to be over, that's... There's not much uh, space to play with there. I do have them on the over at 11 and 5. Their defense is absurd. They added Sheldon Richardson. Their offense is as good as it, it's going to be. The other thing we forgot with Oakland is having Marshawn Lynch, which is an interesting uh, mm-hmm. piece there. Fresh legs, Marshawn Lynch. We'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, they're they're in uh, they're going to be in pretty good shape. Their offensive line is always a worry, and it's scary how bad that thing is. So there's going to be some clunkers, and that's what scares me. But I do have them on the over at 11-5. and five. I think their line impedes them from being 12-4 and four or 13-3 and because there's enough clunkers. Where with Seattle as well, the 11-5s and fives that they get, they almost feel underachieving 11-5s, and fives, you know? Um, so I do have them on the, on the over. They're very good. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think that's where yeah, they are. I, I have them over as well, 12 and 4. Easily could be 11 and 5. Um, offensive line, a little weak. Defense, obviously great. Just got better with the acquisition. Uh, really good home field advantage. Very good coach. Very good general manager. So, good organization all around. Um, you have some tough games with Atlanta. Tough road and, games, uh, too. At Green Bay, yeah. at Tennessee, at LA Rams, yeah. who always play them well. At New York yeah. Giants, I mean, at Arizona, as of course, because that's their division. But at Jacksonville, there's just some, there's going to be some tired legs, I think, by the time they're playing at Dallas in uh, the second to or the penultimate week yeah. of the NFL season. Yeah, but uh, even with all that said, I still have them at twelve and four. That's all right. Both on the over. Here's going to be a surprise, I think. Um, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I've been watching the Hard Knocks. I love it. It's one of my favorite Hard Knocks seasons in a long time. The personalities on this team are amazing. I told you, Jameis reminded me of a, for both positive and negative reasons, a uh, kind of weird mix in both the way he acts and talks of Charles Barkley and Muhammad Ali. And um, they brought in they brought in Deshaun Jackson, who I was listening to something on Pro Football Focus where they were like, boy, everywhere Deshaun Jackson goes, 
quarterbacks have career years. You think about Nick Foles in Philadelphia. You think about uh, what uh, Kirk Cousins was able to do with Deshaun Jackson. Now he's going to go to Jameis Winston. Might be the best quarterback he's ever played with. Um, And I think he provides a safety blanket. He provides that home run potential. And their team is really loaded. They have tight ends. They have receivers. They have big receivers. They have fast receivers. um, Good tight ends. They got a really good defense. And here's what happened. I watched this show and I go, this is no doubt a 10-win team, maybe an 11-win team. And I went through the schedule and I got 8-8. and Really? Under an 8.5. I got 8-8. and I don't know what happened, but I Um, got it. I went to the schedule and I got to 10-6. and Um, yeah, that's because yeah. I, I actually have them beating New England, which sounds crazy perhaps, but I do have them being New England. That's interesting. Um, yeah. I couldn't, I, I couldn't have them be, and you're da- you're not as high on Minnesota. So that's like not a hard road game for you. I think for me, I just looked at it and I like to look in blocks, like four game blocks, six game blocks, uh, two game blocks, you know? And when I was looking at it, I said, boy, the, um, the neutral field could be really weird. That could be one of those kind of strange games where you lose. Um, uh, I could see them underachieving yeah. a little bit, underachieving like uh, Jameis could as he still tries to get to a level of stability he needs to. At Minnesota's tough. The Giants coming in is tough. Um, New you're, England you're coming in. On, you're higher on New Orleans than I am. So like I, I am. I, I well, can't. I think they could split though. Like that, that could be a split. Like a lot of these. Mm-hmm conference I think it's gonna be hard for them to beat New Orleans in New Orleans um and they're at Green Bay yeah I just had a hard time even as much as I love the team and I was convinced before looking at the schedule 10 and 6 I just had uh I don't know I had some trouble with it um which I was the opposite I I wanted to go in probably eight and eight or nine and seven and when I went through the schedule I came up at nine and six so I surprised myself very interesting. All right, so you're over and I am under. You said you got nine wins on them? Ten. Oh, ten. Ten, ten. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they really should be there. I just went through and maybe it was like being, you know, third to last on the list and you just start getting a little punchy. <laughs> you're mm-hmm. like, screw this team. Next up, though, we have the Tennessee Titans, the darlings of the league this year, which can poison and benefit a team depending on how you take it. They are an over under of eight and a half. I did have them over at 10 and six. They feel a little bit of an old school team. They feel a little bit of a not vertical team. They kind of feel like the type of team that plays within the uh, kind of from the tight ends in and runs a lot and uh, plays that way with a real strong running attack, a stable of running backs, good tight ends. They got a good defense. They got just a, they have a really nice team. And I think looking at their schedule uh, and looking at some expected evolutions and people like Marcus Mariota, I see them at 10 and 6. Uh, I have them over two at 11 and 5. And talk about punchy. I had to go back and like after doing their schedule the first time, I had to go back and make a number of adjustments because I think I had them like at 15 and one. <laughs> She's like, oh, what? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> no, I don't know. It, and I think that was just a product of the, picking the other, the, 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 uh, the games, their opponents games earlier. Um, so I did go back and make some adjustments that were more realistic. Uh, I, I feel like there is a danger in, in terms of falling in love with, uh, falling in love with them as a trendy pick. Um, having said that, they don't really have a trendy offense. You know, they have you know good, very strong offensive line. Uh, they have, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Mariota fan. Um, uh, you're pretty good defense. You know, I think Mike Malarkey is an interesting coach, his career and how he wound up there and him getting the job full time almost by default. Uh, but he, uh, he could be riding that uh, into the playoffs this season. But, you know, 11 and 5 is where it is, but um, could very easily be 10 and 6 uh, with a couple of games. But they have to play Oakland, they have to play Seattle. Um, at Pittsburgh, at play. Arizona. Yeah, those are not easy games. And, you know, that, that's where a lot of the L's turn up for me with them. But I still, they landed at 11 and a 5 for me. And then last up, the Washington Redskins are at seven and a half. I was very surprised that they're under Philadelphia. They did lose to Sean Jackson. 
They did lose Pierre Garçon. They added Terrell Pryor, and they added who was the other guy they added? Um, why am I not coming up with that? Let's see here. They added oh Josh Doxson, right? Last year's first round. Well, they didn't add him, but they got him. Josh Doxson will be a main guy, and Terrell Pryor. Terrell Pryor might be one of those guys, like in basketball, uh, big stats on a losing team. He was impressive, and he was a physical freak. There was a lot of – he got a lot of heat from players in the league, which was weird, though. Like, where guys liked trolling him on Twitter and going after him as a player, which is very strange for players to do. So I don't know if that's – if that means that they hate how much he's overachieved with what he does – or if he's really like a phony or something. I, I, I don't know what it is. But uh, now he's in Washington, and he's going to have things expected of him. It's really hard to fill in. Deshaun Jackson, again, hits you some big home runs, and he always seems to be in the middle of big moments. And wide receivers don't really have a chance to do that. There's only a handful who can change games the way he or Odell Beckham can. So, um, But I like the way Washington... They, they don't overachieve to like 10 or 12 wins, but they're the type of team that probably is like five wins and they overachieve, overachieve to eight. So they're sort of, their ceiling is low, but they really get there and they will be a pain in your butt. You always feel like you should beat them as like the Giants with what they have and they find a way to be in it and they find a way to sometimes beat you and annoy the hell out of you. That said, I do have them over at eight and eight uh, over the seven and a half. How about you? I had them at eight and eight as well. So for a lot of the same reasons I gave them, I mean, I was sort of back and forth between giving certain wins to Washington or Philadelphia. I I ended up giving the wins to Washington in this case, just because of the, I think the quarterback and some of the players they have around him. Um, You know, I mean, they have pretty tough schedule with Seattle and Oakland, just like the rest of the NFC East. But uh, I think they have eight and eight in them. And I think they actually performed better last season than I remember. (laughs) I forget that they went into that uh, final week um, final couple of weeks with playoffs on the line. So, uh, you know, eight and eight sounds uh, pretty reasonable for me. Is this Kirk Cousins' last season in Washington? I think uh, very well could be. He could be in San Francisco. Well, depending upon where San Francisco lands in the draft and if they find a quarterback that they like enough, maybe not. But otherwise, uh, I could see him in San Francisco. What about Arizona? Yeah, same thing, maybe. Well, Arizona's not going to finish with a, as good a record. But yeah, well, I mean, happen. but like they might want to move on from. Uh, you know, Carson Palmer, if he throws up an egg on this ends up being his last year. Yeah. Or Minnesota, even (laughs) they can drop both of those (laughs) guys. Keep bringing it back. All right. Well, I think we were on the same page with a lot of this and we'll, uh, I need to go back. I think my Tennessee actually had them at 10 and six, not 11 and five. I went and recounted and I think I I made an error. So if that's the case, we are on the same page. Well, you know, it's funny before I realized it, uh, I was looking at it and I had them at 10 and five and I don't know if that was a mistake, <laughs> but I wrote it. I, I think I just missed the six and wrote five, but uh, yeah, we have it all figured out here. And then uh, oh, yeah. in a couple of weeks, we're going to be done watching football because it's going to be so ugly looking a quarter of the way through. And I plan on uh, finishing well below 500 again this season. Well, good luck to you, Tim. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Matt.